This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I'm Steve Gould, just as the gentleman said. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Avid Company is the sponsor of this podcast, and they have a unique take on firearm holsters you're going to want to check out. If you've got different caliber firearms you like to carry, or you don't like adjusting your holster and firearm every time you get in and out of your vehicle, you need to check out their modular holster system, the Clip Lock. Clip Lock is comprised of a base that attaches anywhere you normally carry and holsters that snap on and off of the base using Avid's patented design. It's never been easier to transition from a subcompact to a full-size weapon regardless of caliber, make, or model. The system also works with Avid's lockbox, allowing you to store your firearm comfortably, securely, and accessibly while you drive. Avid proudly supports service members, veterans, and law enforcement officers, donating a portion of their profits to organizations like the FOP, and their modular holster system is made in America using only the highest quality materials. Pre-orders are live, baby. They're taking orders right now, just in time for the holiday season. Learn more by visiting avidcompany.com. That's A-V-I-D company.com. And remember, supporting our sponsors supports things police see. Guys, I'm so happy to have them on board. The holster is amazing. I'm in the queue to get one. Uh, I'm the kind of guy that carry. I carry all the time. I usually carry a 380 or 9 millimeter. Um, but then if I come home and I want to go for a walk, and we got moose and bear and all that stuff in the woods, I want to clip on a larger caliber. You can do that, no problem. It adjusts to multiple carry positions. And also, driving in the car is a bummer with a holster on a lot of times, especially if you're a little chubby like I am. The ability to take it off and stow it and then reattach it without like undoing your belt and adjusting and all that stuff is incredible. I'm so excited to get my hands on one of these, and you guys really need to go check it out. I'm I'm honored and proud to say we're up we're over 800 reviews, largely predominantly positive, 4.9 stars on Apple Podcasts, which is great. I think we're like 804. Love to get to 1K. Um, it's still it's a little embarrassing. I'm not at a thousand. So if you guys could help me out, put me up there with the big boys. Uh, 1,000 would be awesome. If you if you have a moment, Apple Podcasts, or if you're if you've already done it, and you have a friend who has Apple Podcasts, take their phone. I don't care how I get them. Get it done. I appreciate it so much. Um, thank you to the um, the new Patreon subscribers on Patreon. Links in the show notes. You can go there, join the Patreon community. You get some extras. Patrolman uh, level will get. Uh, you'll get videos, interviews. I'll mail you a uh, TPS logo sticker. And the next level, is Sergeant. You'll get a patron shout out, which I do at the end. You can ask a question. I'll answer on the show. You'll get the videos. You get the vinyl sticker. And uh, for both of them, you'll have direct access to me, messaging, all that stuff. So it's Patreon, it's kind of like a little Facebook feed that only you can see. So if you really love the show and you really want to show your support, you can do that on Patreon. Otherwise, if the, if that's not uh, in your wheelhouse, totally understand. The show is going to remain free. All you need to do is uh, do that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That would be, that'd be fantastic. Um, turned 43 yesterday, everybody. The big four three, which is a weird feeling. Um, I don't know. I think for guys, I think we always feel. I've always felt like twenty, and I, you know, there's days when you look at yourself and you're like, I look pretty good. I think I look twenty. And then there, most of the days, you can see all the lines in your face, and you're like, Who is this guy? Who am I turning into? So I've been feeling it a little bit. Uh, luckily. We started the kettlebells thanks to Billy Broadway, and uh, I'm going to reverse. The Russian guy on the internet said that I could reverse my aging with kettlebells, so that checks out. Internet's always true. I'm going to de-age myself before your eyes. So that's what I have going on. I'm 43, which I, I guess I don't feel any way about it. Uh, I'm glad to still be here. I think it's weird because when you're a kid, there was no way I could imagine being an adult. Like when you're a kid, you try to like fantasize about being an adult, being in charge of yourself, and uh, it's like blink of an eye. There you are. I know the older guys are going to bust my balls about this and be like, ah, 43, you're just a pup. Well, to a 20 year old, and I have worked with people in their twenties, you tell them you're 43 and they're like, whoa, you're old. (laughs) So I am old to some people guys really, really 
fun interview coming up um, today on the show. First time having uh, someone who's an expert in arson investigation. He's uh, he's an expert in that and uh, and a whole lot more. I'm gonna you know as I at, as is tradition, if someone has a good bio written up, I'm just gonna read that. Why should I try to do any better? I can't. So we're talking about Wayne M. Miller, special agent, criminal investigator, certified fire investigator for the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. He was in Boston for 25 years, been involved in numerous high-profile illegal firearms, bombing, and arson cases. During his public and 18-year private career, he examined more than 2,300 fire and explosion scenes, plus provided expert testimony in numerous federal and state courts. In August 2019, he published his first book, Burn, Boston, Burn, recently named by the Global Book, the recently named a Global Book Gold Award winner, followed in 2021 by Bang, Boom, Burn, a 2022 Global Book Silver Award winner. So this guy's got some stuff going on. He had a uh, long and impressive career. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on Wayne M. Miller. Wayne, thank you for coming on the show, brother. Steve, thank you so much, and I'm two months shy of 70. You look and great. I know, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Your mind never catches up with your head. And, you know, I try to look at my 93-year-old dad, and I say, does he think like the kid that I still am? Yes. <laughs> you know, you never grow out of being that kid. Yeah. You know, and besides, I just signed up on your sergeant's rating. All right. Thank you. That's great. I like what you do. Oh, I appreciate that, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I hope, uh, I hope the audience will follow the example of the great Wayne Miller and become a supporter, (laughs) supporter of the show. My, my father is 75 and he was over last night and you know, white eyebrows, white hair. He just, he's gone white. And, uh, he told me the same thing. He goes, Steve, I look in the mirror and I go, who is this old guy? (laughs) You know, I, I play golf with my 93-year-old dad, and the guy just won't realize that he can't hit the ball exactly like he did when he was 50 and 60. Right. And, you know, he used to, you know, he, he would hit like about low 80s, you know. And, you know, we're 100 and, oh, 140 yards from the hole. And I tell him, Dad, use your wood still. Use your wood. No, he'll take out a freaking seven iron and he'll leave it 20 yards short. You know, <laughs> he, he won't learn that he's 93. He's not going to take <laughs> advice from the kid. Not at all. <laughs> but that's awesome. He's still out there. How old is he, did you say? 93. And tomorrow he's driving with my kid's sister, who's 65. They're driving back. They're driving to Georgia tomorrow. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I'd love to hear yeah. it. I'd love to hear it. I don't know about the longevity of, longevity of redheads, but I'm I'm going to cross my fingers for it. Um, Wayne, so you were you were a special agent in the ATF. Um, were you part of Customs at one point? No, no. A- ATF became its own bureau. No, ATF prior to 1972 was the Alcohol Tax Unit, uh, such as um, the Al Capone days. Yep, uh, you know and. Uh, but became its own separate bureau within Treasury. So you had Customs, IRS, Treasury. Secret Service, yeah, Secret Service, and ATF, uh, which you know now is adding an E for explosives at the end, right? Which nobody nobody ever uses. No, it doesn't look good. <laughs> and, uh, the acronym on the back, you know. And then now Justice Department after nine eleven, uh, they all went over to Justice. Okay, gotcha. So you you were a special agent with them. How do you get? Um, how do you wander into the to the arson expertise? Is I mean, I, I imagine field level agents when you start, you're going to get training in in arson ex, in explosions. Um, but how do you kind of how do you find your way to being an expert in that? Sure, you, you know the gist of the the main thrust of work for ATF is gun cases, right? And, and 1976, I know that's a long time ago. Uh, When I came on in 76, they doubled the Boston district, which is all of New England, from 40 to 80 agents. So they added 40 agents in 1976. Over the next 25 years, they only added 40 agents over 25 more years. So so all of us were working basically gun cases. I mean, 
There was a concentrated urban enforcement, Q, C-U-E, to get gun crime under control, just like today right. they need a new, a new concentration on gun crime. So they did that in the 70s, and they brought all us young guys on. So we ended up working undercover cases and paper cases and stuff like that. But that's not what I ended up wanting to do for my career. ATF got started to get serious about fires. In the late 70s, they just started. But by 1980, 82, they, 82, they formed Arson Task Force Cities. Uh, the first four was Boston, Chicago, New York, L.A. And because the cities were burning down and the state and local people, you know, they could do simple cases, but they couldn't do the more complex cases, say an arson for profit with a landlord burning 20 of his properties or something like oh that. Oh, my gosh. You know, because... You know, the complex cases take time, mm -hmm. money, money, and expertise. So if uh, there's a domestic dispute and the guy throws a Molotov cocktail in the doorway to trap his girlfriend in her apartment, you know, that's a fairly easy crime to solve. Right. So, so the whole, again, thrust behind ATF is to assist state and local people with their problems. Uh, so I joined the Arson, ATF Arson Task Force, which formed in 1982, March of 82. Okay. Um, uh, we had eight to ten agents in the group at that time. For all of New England? Uh, yes, for investigative purposes. Um, we didn't have our own certified fire investigators yet. Certified fire investigator is typically somebody who's trained to go into a fire scene and dig out the scene, figure out where it started and how it started. Uh, ATF started their own program in 1986, which I volunteered for. I, see, I wasn't in the military. I didn't learn. You're not supposed to volunteer for everything. You know? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, I volunteered to become a certified fire investigator, CFI, in 1986. I was still in the arson group, still work regular cases, but now – after two years, you graduated. You had to go to a minimum of 100 fires in that two years and have something like 120 hours of training oh, in wow. the two-year period. Um, I now have 3,000 hours of fire investigation training and wow. 38 years because I did it 18 years on the private side after ATF. 18, uh, so 38 years altogether, uh, 2,300 fire and explosion scenes. Uh, in 43 states, and uh, even in Puerto Rico. Uh, that's the only one outside the, the, the 48 state, contingent states. Okay. Um, so uh, it's something that I knew I wanted to do. Um, very it's got to be, be super interesting. Oh, you know, think about it. On any one case, you got an eyewitness, and that person could be a homeless person, a cabbie, uh, it, it could be a homeowner, a business owner, it could be the eyewitness, a passerby. And then you got to interview the owners and the occupants. And then if it's a business, and that's what the thrust is, again, it's, it's uh, the building that burns should affect interstate commerce, meaning you go to your favorite restaurant and they sell you salmon. They don't get the salmon from around the corner. They get it from someplace else right? Uh, out, out of state. So, if the restaurant burns, they can no longer sell the salmon. So it affects interstate commerce. Okay. So, so the, mostly we would work on businesses, except that as a certified fire investigator, I joined up with my local people in the counties around me, mm -hmm. and they invited me to fire after fire so I could see more fires and I could teach them what I've been learning from my training classes. And it was education both ways. Yeah. So – I knew that it would be so interesting, Steve, that you're interviewing all these people and you got a puzzle in front of you. Like, I'm looking at you and me right now. Make these views into a puzzle and try to put that puzzle together. Right. And you know, I'd, stand in, I'd stand in your bedroom that burned up and say, okay, what have we got going on here? What happened here? And you, you have to look at so much and learn so much. 
Yeah, I did. Um, I did insurance investigations for a couple of years, and I did some um, torched cars. I wasn't really trained in mm-hmm. arson, uh, and and with insurance investigations, you could you'd interview a few people and kind of get the you know because when you when you sign an insurance policy, you signed the insurance company, you agree to a SIU investigation. So yes, if they don't cooperate, it's a lot easier than police work because you just go, okay, we just won't pay it, and they go away. So, you know, bank records, cell phone records, they got to give it to you. It's great. No warrants needed. Right. But, um, you know, I, we'd have experts. If it was a higher money case. We'd have experts, um, uh, uh, forensic mechanics, and they were good with arson. But if you're looking at a burnt out car or house and you don't know, it's like looking at a burnt car, trying to figure out where that originated from, the fire, to me, it was like a complete, could have started at the tailpipe. I couldn't tell anything. Yes. So the experts would come in, and these guys were amazing, and they could they could pinpoint all that stuff. Um, I have a question for you, Wayne. In Massachusetts, the the highest state official we have is the fire marshal, right? Yes. And is that a, I should know this, but is that within the state police, or is it is its own office? Good question. The state fire marshal himself is appointed by like the governor. Okay. However, underneath him, he has the state fire marshal's office, which is in Massachusetts. They are state troopers assigned to the fire marshal's office. You okay. know, in New England, in New England, you got Connecticut, they're troopers. Rhode Island, they're not. They're usually retired from someplace else, and they they join the fire marshals. Um, Maine, I don't think they're, fi- they're troopers. Vermont, the troopers, they are. And New Hampshire, they are. I worked with non-troopers up there, so I, I think it's non-troopers. New Hampshire does everything a little bit different. Um, <laughs> they got a lot, of, a lot of freedom up there going on. Um, <laughs> yeah. So these are the guys, and you probably, you guys are going to each other's burns to to get the hours you need and to kind of work with. So the, mostly in mass would probably be troopers, or maybe a big city might have a cop specialized in that. Yeah, the biggest cities, uh, Springfield, uh, Worcester, and Boston, they have a pretty large and efficient uh, fire and bomb explosion, you know, fire and explosion uh, investigators. And uh, they do a lot of their own work. They don't invite the fire marshal typically. Um, but when you develop relationships with these people, you end up working with them as a federal agent, too. Yeah, I bet. Um, cause I remember, uh, I just thought of that cause what was the movie with Ben Affleck and he was like, uh, remember it was some line that like, why does this firefighter have a gun? I think he was like a, a fire marshal or something like that. Do you remember that movie? Not with Ben Affleck. I don't know. Oh, jeez. All right. Well that went to a dead end. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, can you looking back at all, all these investigations you did, um, what was the first one as like a young new to the new to the business of doing these investigations? Was there a real notable first one that you had one that was really like, you know, complex or interesting <laughs> and, uh, on the fire end or just ATF uh, either or well, I'll give you a little of both. Okay. Um, so I got on in 76 and 19 and I really can't remember anything before 1980, <laughs> but uh April 1980, uh, I got a call to respond to Walpole, Mass. I lived in uh, Norfolk County, and um, um, yeah, called from Walpole, Mass. They had a small fire, and I wasn't doing fires yet. I started doing fires later on in 1980. Right. And it was in a raised ranch in a garage, and my ex-brother-in-law is the Walpole chief now, but uh, I've talked to these guys since and put in a story into my second book. And they forced their way into the smoky garage. And when they got to a uh, Rubbermaid-style trash barrel, they flipped open over something that was covering it, and there were 17 guns in there. Ooh. And eventually they saw more guns in the house. They called me right away because uh, – one of the Walpole detectives introduced me to my first wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I was very good friends with them. And I was in Boston that day, and I got the call and respond immediately to Walpole. It's detectives asking for you. 
They got these M16A1s, 46 of them. Old school. 40, 46 M16s. Wow. You know, that was stolen four years early out of, uh, earlier out of an armory in uh, Danvers, Mass. And there were actually 92 stolen. So the other 46 showed up in Northern Ireland. Oh, so, wow. So here I am racing down to Walpole. And, you know, I'm four years on the job. I'm all of uh, 27 years old. Oh, wow. And, That's a young Yeah. Yeah, I got on the job when I was 23. So um, so I'm racing down, and you get this. We beat the uh, state police there. We ended up getting a telephonic search warrant, which was like one of the first ever. So I'm calling to my supervisor, who's relaying to the U.S. attorney to get a search warrant for this property. Oh, and, I'd uh, like to be able to do that. That's great. <laughs> and it was just, it was like racing against the uh, st- state police at the time and everything like that. And the guy who was in the house when the fire occurred, uh, some woman knocked on his door and said, there's smoke coming out of your garage. He says, oh, I've taken care of it. Like, she understood that to be, I called the fire department. He took off. And it was such a fun case. Uh, at one point, I knew Charlie Gallant, it was his name. Charlie was a big drinker. And uh, he came out of Hyde Park. And... During this investigation, two guys drive by in a black Cadillac in this little residential suburb. And we had an agent chase them down and identify them. They ended up being arrested later on for being part of this. Yeah. But Charlie took off and he just disappeared for a while. And I knew he was a big drinker out of Hyde Park. So I went to Hyde Park Liquors and I, I had bought some guns undercover a couple of years before the night Elvis died. I was in Hyde Park buying guns undercover. So <laughs> I remember, I remember yeah. Elvis dying. Uh, but uh, so this liquor store owner had a couple of guns that I bought undercover. And then back then the rightful owner could get the guns back. So I gave him the guns back and he said, you ever need anything at the liquor store? Just come on in. I never did until looking for Charlie. I said, did you ever see this guy? He showed him a picture. I never did, never did. And I, I didn't expect to hear from him. And two days later, Charlie came in there to buy some booze. And this guy calls up in the middle of the night. Now, ATF back then, you ended up getting to Washington, D.C., and nobody called me until Monday. I didn't find out. Right. But we, we ended up, Charlie got caught drunk driving in Connecticut. And Charlie said, eventually said, because he wouldn't tell him who he was. He said, you'd call the FBI if you knew who I was. You know? What an idiot. People, the things people we, say when they're drunk. Yeah. We got no respect either. ATF, you know, uh, you knock on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm with ATF. Can I start, talk to your husband? And the woman turns around and says, "Han, the FBI's here. You know, we got no no respect. <laughs> Everybody's you know? the FBI. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Jolly, I, I raced down to Connecticut and beat the state police there again. And Charlie begged me to stay in prison with him that night because he said, there's got to be a hit out of me for losing all those guns. Ooh. You know, so Oops. I said, I said, Charlie, you tell me who and where and why you had those guns. And I will gladly take care of you. And he wouldn't tell me. Really? He was an old, old style criminal. Old style. He says, I've been a thief all my life. I'm going to be a thief when I get done with this. He says, you got your job. See, the respect for law enforcement was so much different. Yeah. You got your your job. I got my job. Ten years later, I saw Charlie on the steps of the Dedham Superior Courthouse. And I know who you are. <laughs> and he said, I know who you are. And we talked. And he said, I told you I'd never change. He was there for another B&E stealing stuff, you know. <laughs> and in Massachusetts, you can just keep coming out, uh, coming out the door, the revolving yeah. the door. <laughs> yeah. He did eight years for the guns, but oh, okay. uh, yeah. So well, but uh, federal federal law usually has pretty good teeth. Put you yeah. away. So I so I had to race down there, and here you know the thoughts are going through your head when we would, you know, I got brief words that we would cover. There's a lot of guns here and stuff like that. So that was that was a big case. That's cool. And, uh, on the fire end of it, oh uh, uh, Wayne, let me ask you what what was the fire? Like why was it? Oh that. <laughs> we think he he had a uh, common law 
wife, but she wasn't involved the night before. Somebody else was. And he had a fire in the fireplace. <laughs> I think he took the ashes and dumped them in a the freaking Rubbermaid trash container. And that's what caused the fire. Half these people <laughs> would never get caught. if they didn't do something. It's like the guy who's speeding by you, you pull him over, he's got a warrant. You're like, why are you doing 75 and a 50? Yeah. Just go yeah. to the speed limit and everyone looked at you. Um, yeah, I got a... I got a hundred pounds of drugs in my car and I'm driving by like a fool. Right. You know? <laughs> those, those machine guns you're talking about. Um, I remember going to an instruct, I'm a firearms instructor for the PD and in like 2005 or six, I went to a, uh, you know, instructor research. So all the instructors meet on the Cape and we go through our guns and um, I want to say Marshfield, maybe their chief had bought a bunch of those guns. I, I guess the government must've sold a bunch of them the old uh, M16s and uh, the, when it was time to do rifle, the guy said, uh, you want to see the rifle I got in my trunk? It's in every trunk of one of our cruisers. And we're like, yeah, full auto, full sized M16. The chief, the chief of police bought them and just put them in all the cars and was like, Hey, if, if you get into the real stuff, we got machine guns now. Uh, I never heard a chief think like that in my life. I'm like, really? Most no. chiefs were like, make sure those are not full auto. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Dang. Uh, yeah. So on the fire end of it, when I was really working fires, um, you know, there's a couple of different things that really stick out in a sense. Um, the Worcester Mass warehouse fire. Oh, where the firefighters died. Yeah, six firefighters coming up on December 3rd for, if you want to call it an anniversary date. Yeah, it was a big um, one. 1999. I, I saw it on the news, and I knew it was going to be so big, so I called my supervisor and just jumped in the car and went out. And that was on a Friday evening. And Worcester's only about 20 miles from my house. So I got there fairly quick. And, um, you know, I stayed most of that night. And for the next uh, 10 days, I was there every single day, uh, except for grabbing some sleep. And, um, you know, when you're driving to that and you hear on the on TV that there's, you know, uh, I think they reported at least four firefighters lost at that point. And uh, you're driving there and you're just thinking all the horrible stuff because if they're lost in that type of building, they're, they're gone already, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, it's three weeks before Christmas. Any time is a bad time, but it just, you know how it's amplified during the holidays. Sure. You know, tragedies. And um, it's it's the one that sticks with me the most. Um, my uh, father-in-law was a th- captain in Revere. Uh, my brother-in-law was a captain in Revere. Uh, my wife lived through, she lived before she met me, she lived in East Boston. And the triple deckers are side by side. And four of them burned down one night. She was in the second one. Wow. Uh, and uh, so she lived through a, a fire. So uh, it's, my respect for firefighters is is just off the charts. Yeah, absolutely. It, you know. When you show so, up to like, a, a warehouse fire, something that big where you know there's been loss of life. Where do you start? Like, what is the first thing you do? That was a totally different situation because a Worcester needed to recover their six fallen brothers. Right. So in that case, the the sixth firefighter was not recovered for eight days. Mm. Um as a matter of fact, it took three days, I think, to get the first one um, because it was a six-story, almost block-sized building that basically collapsed to the second floor. And they had to delayer with heavy equipment. You know, obviously, the roof and sixth floor is the top material, and they laid it out so investigators – uh, well, firefighters from all over New England were participating and sifting and raking th- through all that debris to look for button-sized uh, remains 
of the firefighters mm. uh, looking for any evidence and the actual physical evidence of the fire the cause of the fire was on the second floor so we didn't have to worry too much about that stuff until they got down but the state fire marshals the state troopers stayed on the deck too i was off by the side and i was just watching a lot of this for eight days until I assisted them. I was one of three people that wrote the final report for that case. And I assisted them with the origin and cause of that fire. And, um, but you start typically on any building, you start on the outside. Uh, that's again, what, what a lay person wouldn't think of. How do you, how do you solve this fire? That the building is like half gone. Right. So, and you, you start with interviews you know, is there a person in the building first that you can interview? Is there who? Obviously, there's a first eyewitness who calls it in. The first police officer is usually the one on the, you know, after the call. They get there before firefighters. Right. You interview all these people. I went. I've got one in the uh, second book. Um, I think it's like six hundred thousand square feet, like maybe seven or eight buildings. It looked like an absolute war zone. If, if you and I went there with no information, we would have no idea where to start. But when the first firefighters pulled up, it was at the first floor, we call it AB, the front left side, first floor of one of those buildings. So we knew we had to concentrate there. I mean, that was another four-story place that collapsed completely to the ground. So eventually we had to get into that first floor in that corner to find out what we had. When you're when you're in Worcester at that warehouse, um, for all those days, do you have you must have family members showing up, or um, <laughs> that must have been so intense. It wasn't just family members; it was the city of Worcester showed up. Um, the they had a line, obviously a line, you know, about 150 feet away. Right. That people people just every single day for eight days. Um, behind the barriers, uh, there was an engine company, and it, it, one of their older fire trucks parked underneath Route 290, which was right next to the fire building. And that became the memorial. I mean, it was covered with flowers and signs. And that's the, the one case that I break down at when I talk. I, I do a lot of speaking events. Yeah, I talk, I talk all over the country and if I talk about that particular fire, um, I have a hard time not breaking down when I'm looking at the slide with the uh, the engine, with the signs that they had in the windows of that engine and stuff. It just tears me apart. And, um, you know, the crowds there, the press, you know, when they, when they had the memorial, which was only before the bodies were all recovered, it was uh, Friday, ha- fire happened on Friday, the following Thursday, they had a memorial at the Centrum, the, the Worcester DCU Center, whatever they call it nowadays. And they had, you know, the uh, vice president came, um, you know, politicians came. We had about 10,000 firefighters. Wow. And all of, all of them couldn't even fit inside the DCU. I think it hold, held 7,500 people. And uh, it was just an amazing, horrible event. And uh, I remember some criticism about it for the fire chief about, you know, there was no one in there, but so why were they, why were they sending the guys in if there was no, it was There's no, you know, unless there was some vagrants in there, but there was no like apparent loss of life that was going to happen. But now we have six dead firefighters. Is it? It is a um, vacant for 20 years at the time. And a diner owner, the diners right next to the building. He said, these two homeless people sleep in there all the time. Oh. And now the fire, the fire comes in like at six o'clock at night and they don't know. And that's what firefighters do. Yeah, They sent in, they sent in two, but a cold storage building is an unusual animal. It, over the years, it's divided up into different lockers to hang your, your meat, when before refrigeration originally when it was built and you can get lost in there easily. Um, so the first two firefighters got lost 
and there's no windows from the second above the second floor. Zero windows. Oh man! Can you get your bearings? They, yes. So they couldn't even tell what floor they were on. So firefighters who went to look for them, they sent two originally to look for them, and those two guys like disappeared into the night, and two more went in, possibly without being told to go in, and to try to find sure. the lost brethren. And uh, they also got lost and uh, disappeared. So the chiefs at that point, I give him the courage award of the year. He stood in the stairway where these guys had gone up and gotten lost. And of course, the firefighters all want to go up and try to find them, uh, you know, in the chance that they're still alive. Yeah. And he blocked the stairway. You know, the courage to do that, the, the balls yeah, to do that and say, no more. I'm not going to lose any more. And they would have. They would have lost more. Yeah. And, you know, I, they respect him for it. I mean, it hurt at the time, but they respected him for it. Wow. I'm, you know, glad, I, I'm glad to get that piece of information. That's amazing. God bless those firefighters and their families. That is uh, – that was tra- – I mean, they still, they still have um, – have a memorial for it every year, you know, for every, every year. Yeah. You know, it's usually on TV too. Uh, you know, they mention it on the news every single year. Yeah. Wayne, can you describe a, like a strange or bizarre thing you've dealt with in your ATF career? I'm sure you have plenty. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, the book right on this, side, uh, this side of me, let's see, you got to lean the opposite direction. Bang, boom, burn. That's a collection of 21 short stories. Uh, up in Lawrence, the city uh, of Lawrence. Beautiful Lawrence. Uh, yeah, we had a case through the state police. They had a guy buying some drugs. And they found out their informant was going to end up being the driver for a guy who was going to blow up a building. It was a laundromat. And they were going to disconnect the gas line and he was going to cause an explosion that way. So, but we couldn't wire the informant because they were using him on some big drug cases, but he was the driver. So I'm in a van with like four other guys, uh, you know, one of the nicely painted vans back then. And we're parked like right across the street from the building. And I'm in charge of the operation. And, we're sitting in the pie. It's July, and it's hotter than hell. We got windows open, but we're sitting on the floor. And all white guys so in a largely his bay area, you know, always horrible. Car pulls up next to us, and it the arsonist gets out on the passenger side right next to my driver's door, and he takes a leak right next to us. <laughs> I mean. I talk about it. I could have held it for him. That's how close he was, you know. <laughs> so he goes in across the street into the building. And I, you know, I'm looking at my watch. And like 37 seconds later, he comes out. He couldn't have done what he has to he, And I'm in charge. He couldn't have done it. And I'm like, and I'm talking to the guys around me. He couldn't have done it. It's too short a time period. He couldn't have set up anything in that time period and the car took off with him and I'm sweating bullets thinking you know I'm going to get transferred to Detroit or something <laughs> you know this place is going to blow up and you know I'm going to be a fool about five seven minutes later they pull up again on the street and he jumps out again in the middle of the street and goes back in the doorway comes out later on that we find out he had forgotten a flashlight. So People here forget I am, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> here I am sweating my ass off, and he forgot a flashlight. And so his nickname was Cookie. So Cookie went inside, and um, I, I a couple guys go right next to him, next to the doorway. We had state police surrounded behind the building. We had the gas company on notice waiting. We had Lawrence Fire Department with us. As a matter of fact, right in the van with me was uh, Lawrence Lieutenant. And I told Kevin Ord, who's passed away from brain cancer, I told Kevin, 
I said, when he comes out that door, we're going to be standing across the street. You take a picture so we silhouette the doorway and the whole bit. Okay, like two or three minutes later. And uh, right away, the two guys next to the doorway put them down on the ground and put some cuffs on them. And I reached down to the cuffs and pick them up and say, you know, what were you doing in the building? He said, oh, you know, the owner said I could sleep there, you know. I said, well, let's go see you where you were going to sleep. We open the door. There's a candle on the t- – it's like four steps down into the basement. Mm. And there's a candle on the top step. Kevin, take a picture of that, and I'll blow it out right after. So he, he took a picture, and I blew it out. You could hear the two-inch main roaring. It doesn't hiss. It's loud. Mm. And – I walked down and I put my flashlight and I could see the gas end cap was off. The two inch main was just flowing, uh, you know, Yikes. so many cu- cubic feet of gas. By the way, let's get out of here, you know? Yeah. So we get out of there and the gas company and the fire department come and make it safe. But uh, cook, we want a cookie to make a phone call to the owner who hired him to do it. But a cookie was an old-time informant of an ATF agent who retired. And I had to get a hold of that agent for Cookie to talk to him because he wouldn't talk to anybody else. And by then, we couldn't make that phone call. It was too late and, you know, uh, that type of stuff. And That's nuts. And and the, late, the last part of that's a little twist, there was no film in the camera. No! <laughs> Back in the day of film. Yeah. Oh, at least you had multiple witnesses, you know? Yeah. Kevin was working his ass off for Lawrence back then. Uh, they didn't have a real Austin squad, and he was running left and right and left and right, and he just forgot the film. Oh, man. <laughs> well, you still you still got him, right? Yeah, he went to prison for his part. How, how much were you sweating? I mean, uh, so you set up a – you set – you're surveilling this thing. You know what's going to happen. What if that guy ran, you, you guys allow him to run in there and the building blows up? Would you, I mean, that's got to be on your, on your mind too. Like what if, what if we, you, cause you know, the court, the, the courts would say, Hey, you had enough. Why did you let him go in? Or, you know, whatever they would, they would say what they'd Monday morning, Monday morning quarterback you. So you must've been yeah. nervous that he was actually, you know, I mean, this guy's not a brain surgeon. He could have screwed up and blown the building up. And then they would have been like, the ATF knew he was going to do it. And then they let it happen. That would drive me yeah. nuts. Yeah, it was driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had the okay of the uh, uh, the front office, you know, the bosses. Had the okay of uh, the U.S. Attorney's office. but And, you know, again, we had the gas company. But, you, you know, like you're saying, this could have happened almost at any time. And how about when he walked out and I let him go? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I, That's so intense. I, I was dying a thousand deaths. <laughs> I remember in um, the little town I worked for on Cape Cod, there was a guy who we got a witness, uh, an informant that said, this guy's going to rob the bank. He are, he's got it planned out. He's got the gun, blah, blah, blah. So we get the FBI involved in the whole thing. And um, similar thing, they were cool with, they talked, first of all, they talked to the tellers. Will you play ball if we, if we let them come in? And they said, yeah. Whoa. Like the three female yeah. tellers are like, yeah, let them come in. Um, and then the same type of scenario. I was thinking, wow, the, the FBI is in charge of it and they're experts at bank robberies. They want the guy, they want the guy that said he's going to go in there with a gun. They want to let him walk into the bank. And I thought, oh my gosh, they just to make that decision. Cause you know, if he takes hostages, what if he shoots somebody in the face? These guys right. are usually drug addicts. You know, it's like, they're not, yeah. you can't predict them, but yeah, that's why you get the big bucks, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right, you know. Oh, man. Um, so you want to marry my daughter? Yes, I do. So do you hang out in the hood all the time, or do you just come up here for our food and women? This January. Your family, my family. I don't know how this is going to work. I like your braids. Thank you. Exhibit had braids. Jonah Hill, Lauren London, David Duchovny, Nia Long, with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Eddie Murphy. What's up with white cuz? Am I white cuz? Well, I'm not. You People, directed by Kenya Barris. Rated R. Now streaming only on Netflix. 
Discover the advantages of the Samsung Front Load Laundry Pairs at Lowe's. These large capacity washers and dryers are designed for versatility. Stack them, place them side by side, or use pedestals in exciting new colors such as brushed black with rose gold accents. Plus, Wi-Fi capabilities that allow you to control everything from your smartphone. Find the Samsung Front Load Laundry Series at Lowe's today. Home to any possibility. Yeah, so that is a crazy good one. cases. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's get into. Um, I, I read up a little bit on the um, Burn Boston Burn. That is an insane story of arson, one of the largest investigated in our country. Can you give us a lowdown on exactly what that was? I sure can. And it is so crazy that it's, they just bought my book rights. Hell yeah. Uh, for um, Their intention is to make a dramatic series. No and right Congratulations. Now, That's amazing. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they um, they signed the contract, the whole bit. Um, if they can sell it to Netflix or whoever. Yep. Um, I have a screenwriter and a producer already working on it. Beautiful. And... Yeah, they are going to make me executive producer for every episode. I knew you win. You run things, please. <laughs> so, executive producer Wayne and Miller, you know, it's going to be it, it's surreal, is what it is. Isn't you know, cool? to go to go from investigator to a writer who self publishes a couple of books. Um, so, uh, burn, boss, and burn. Good title for it. My my son in law did that cover and. The cover for both books gets uh, crazy good reviews too. Yeah. Ton of reviews. Yeah, I'm almost up 400, and uh, yeah, mostly pretty good. I, I, I like um, another podcaster said, you know, I got a bad review because I hated law enforcement or something, but I got a bad review because the pages started falling out. The book they bought from Amazon, they gave me one star, and you know what that does to your ratings? <laughs> you know, oh, As, I have people Wayne that listen to this show. They will, they're, they're fans of the show. They've listened to 50 episodes and then one episode, they never give me a review and then no attaboys, nothing. They'll say in the review, I've been a fan of the show for this long. And then they will criticize one episode and give me one star. Yeah. Hate that. Well, what about know? the 50 re- <laughs> interviews you liked? Right. You give me a one. Right. And like you said, that, that hurts a one star when you're going for five. That yeah. brings that, you know, we all know how yeah. um, averages are tabulated. That screws you. But it yours does. yours is, I mean, I think it's four and a half or five stars anyway. So you're weathering yeah, the storm, like, brother. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I take it to heart when I get a bad review. And there were so many fires in this book. Uh, these are nine guys. Three of them were cops. Three of them were firefighters. Who set. 264 buildings on fire in two years. What the hell? What year was you this? Know, from 82 to 84. Some kind of, um, were they protesting something through because of union yeah. mal- malfeasance or whatever? Uh, they were protesting Proposition 2.5. You're from Massachusetts. Proposition 2.5 got voted in November 4th, 1980, the same day that Ronald Reagan got voted in and the same day that Master arsonist-to-be, Greg Bemis, turned 20 years old. Greg Bemis is one of the main, one of the main arsonists in this book. So what is, that, what is that proposition? So simply, if you have a property that's $100,000, it can only be taxed to 2.5% of that value, or 2500 And Boston, Springfield, Worcester, Lawrence, all the old cities had a lot of low-valued properties. So the cities and towns started laying people off, not knowing where the money was going to come from to pay these people. Oh, okay. So I'll stick with Boston because these guys concentrated on Boston to begin with. Uh, Boston lost 600 firefighter positions out of 1,700. That's well over one-third. Wow. That's a lot. And they closed 22 fire companies. So – Think about your firehouses in some small cities where you've been, and you closed down 22 fire companies. It's insane. You know, they had painted over the doorways closed and stuff like that. And, you know, the apparatus would sit there and stuff like that. So 
So these guys, in a twisted version of Robin Hood, and this, I came up with this type of thing, instead of stealing from the rich to give to the poor, they said, if we set enough fires, the people are going to scream, the press is going to pick it up, and they really wanted the press. And that will put pressure on the politicians to find the money to put these guys back on the job. I see. And that was the goal. So they started with their first fire in March of uh, February of 1982. And the Austin Task Force for ATF started in March of 82. It had nothing to do with them. They didn't know about us. We didn't know about them. And it's just pure coincidence. And uh, they ramped up during the spring into the summer. June 11th, 1982 was the busiest night in Boston Fire Department history. There were 11 fires that night, and I think six of them were multiple alarm fires, up to nine alarms, two of them on the same night. Wow. Nine, nine alarms, the biggest uh, number of alarms that they go to. And they had two of them on the same night. And they had a six and a four, I think, also on the same night. Um, so they're running ragged. Uh, like fire companies from Weymouth, from Norwood, you know, we're talking 20 miles away, were coming in to fight fires. They didn't even know where, how to find the address. You don't have uh, GPS. Yeah, I'm sure it sucked <laughs> yeah. all, the, all the burbs in. Yes, absolutely. And, and then when we started getting not onto the specific guys, but started doing surveillances and stuff, then they would go to Canton, Cambridge, Quincy, Everett, Lawrence, Lowell, all the way to Fitchburg. In November 1982, they went all the way to Fitchburg and set four major multiple alarm fires in one night. And I love to tease people with this. Somebody almost died that night, and it wasn't by fire. And that's how I teased that night. So they're gonna, that's going to be one episode all by itself, they said, probably, is the night they went to Fitchburg. Well, wow, yeah, Fitchburg's not – my the church I attend is in um, Westminster. It's right next door to Fitchburg. Oh, sure. And yeah, Fitchburg's um interesting town. It's a uh, – a little rough, a little rough around the edges these days. Yeah. Um, but wow. So I, I can't get my mind around, um, you know, taking an oath, being in the, hmm. being a police officer or being in the fire service. And then somehow you do the mental gymnastics of the, you know, that greater good thought pattern of this is because you're, you're going to put firefighters and to a lesser extent, police officers at risk, your colleagues, your probably friends, could die because of this. Do you th were they getting were they getting attaboys or backing from people that like other firefighters? Were they like keep it up, boys? Is that, was that happening? That's a great question, and I do cover that uh, because eventually, two hundred firefighters did get hurt, uh, not civilians, because they chose to do abandoned or empty. Uh, businesses at night, you know, yep. but 200 firefighters got hurt. And, you know, one real serious fire, October 2nd, 1982, 22 firefighters came through the roof uh, with broken backs, broken legs, burns and stuff like that. But these guys were so friendly. They're fire buffs too. I, I, forget, I forget to mention that a lot of time. Fire buffs are just like sports fans. They collect memorabilia. Uh, they even buy fire trucks for their own. I've seen that. Uh, yep. Yeah. And um, they like to photographs, so they will go to fire so they can photograph. Now, they photograph it, and they like to watch the firefighting operations. Are the firefighters going to win? They get, how are they going to do? How are they going to knock this one down? Uh, these guys would actually cheer for the fire. Okay? They would cheer for the home team who's the home team the fire not the firefighters they're the ones who Damn. come and visit right so um they would go to the firehouses and have dinner with these guys say as fire buffs uh, you know one was a boston cop one was a boston firefighter himself uh these other guys came from outside the city but they were police uh two became boston housing authority cops and they were called firefighters in other outside towns. And 
you make friends, lots of friends. And you can be, they can be pulling up on an engine company. Hey, how you doing? You know, waving to them right after they set the fire. Okay. Ugh, and uh, they would go to, they would go, there's organizations, professional you know, organizations call this like Boston Sparks Association. Mm -hmm. They're legitimate sparking. Sparking is a nickname for a fire buff. Um, you spark a fire, you go to a fire to watch it. You know, that's what it's called. And two of these guys were members of the Sparks. Two of them would never be allowed. They got voted down. So those guys hated the Sparks Club. And they would go to the Sparks Club picnic. I've been to it with my wife now and stuff. And, um, you know, firefighters, the engine companies will pull up in Boston and they'll have a quick They'll cook hot dogs and hamburgers for the guys and stuff, and then they go back to work. Um, and it's a great organization. It's been around 100 years. And I'm not kidding, 100 years. Wow. <laughs> okay. And um, so these guys would spark the fires. They'd, they'd go watch these fires all the time. And they'd go to the Sparks picnic, and they'd be sitting with the guys. This is kind of sick. Oh, this was – it was a strange time because she lost 600 firefighter positions. So the guys on the job saying, oh, I love this, that they were getting so many fires and stuff like that. Yeah, I wish they'd set a couple on my shift, you know, stuff oh, like that. Geez. And what do you think? He's using – how much gasoline is he? Like, we should, like, collect some money for this guy for gasoline. It's um, joking around. Yeah, joking around because, you know – when you're a big city, when you become a firefighter, a big city firefighter, you're there to fight fires, you know? You're I mean, it's, it's, it's gallows humor, too. I mean, cops do the same you know? thing. It's yeah. They're joking around. You're not there to f sit in the firehouse all the time. Right. So they would joke around with these guys, and that gave these guys a big head. They loved it. They loved suck, sucking it up, you know? And they had the picnic in June. In the evening, and they went and set three or four fires right after, so these guys could go to these fires. You know, that's it's incredibly <laughs> screwed up, man, and bizarre. It's a bizarre case all the way around. You know, there's just so many aspects that are just off the wall. Um, well, we'll never be able to cover the nuance that's in the book, but can you mm -mm. can you let us know um, how did you how did how did you wrap it up? How did you how did your leads lead you to the solving it sure sure um boston wbc photographer who was a fire buff himself but got paid to be out there shoot these pictures dream job for night. sparky right yes absolutely <laughs> and he's my after my wife he's my biggest supporter oh so, no kidding. Uh, that's awesome yep yeah, yep yeah. and uh so he goes out and he's shooting uh november 21 1982 uh, a lumberyard fire in Hyde Park, Dedham Line. And he hears this god-awful noise. Human, it's a human noise, but it's a god-awful noise. And he comes around a lumber pile, and he sees like four of these guys leaning and squatting on the lumber pile. And, and they're hooting and hollering for the fire. And he had some thoughts about a couple. He didn't know all of them by name, but he had a couple thought, bad thoughts that these guys might be involved, yeah. you know? And he swung his camera around and the Boston cop took out of uniform, out of his shoulder holster, pulled his pistol. Oh my gosh. And wa waved it in the air as if he's on a bucking Bronco for about two seconds. His friend said, he's filming you and he puts it back in and, we got to see that the next day and identify these guys. And we knocked on his door, the cop's door, two days later at his house. And he That must lied. have been tense going up to that door knowing this guy. Number one, he's a cop, so you know he's armed. Number two, he's capable of doing this type of stuff, and you're about to confront him. He's wacky as all hell, right? <laughs> you know? yeah. I'm with my, par my partner, a good Irish kid, Billy Murphy. And uh, we knock on his door. He lets us in. He, he doesn't sweat at all. He just lies right to our face. Sociopath. And he was good. He was good. Exactly. And I, I, I described what a sociopath is in the book. Yeah. And I said, these guys must be. But, <clears throat> excuse me, sitting on his living room floor was a stolen firebox, the kind that you, you know, you can pull up. It might be on a, 
utility pole, uh, a pedestal somewhere. Okay. Boston had Boston had hundreds of them back in the day. They're considered stolen property, no matter how you get it. And he says, "Oh, I got that at this flea market or something." And Billy looks at it close and says, "Oh, my my dad used to make." Laps out of these things. He just wanted to get a little closer so he could read the number off the front. 1712 was the number. We raced back to the office because he had a mimeograph. How many people in your audience know what mimeograph is? None. <laughs> a mimeograph. <laughs> That's how you copied things in those days. It had that blue ink and you copied. Oh, like a carbon type of thing? So, sort of. <laughs> but it's before that even. And, uh, so he had a copy on, under his desk blotter that had 14 boxes listed as missing and stolen that year. And that was the first one missing. Wow. So that was the first thing. We ended up with a local search warrant, put some pressure on him. He took a polygraph and flunked. Um, then we couldn't talk to him for, that was December of 82. And his lawyer said he can't talk. And, Boston Internal Affairs conducted their own investigation, so we didn't interfere with that. And we didn't talk to him again until January. It sounds like a short time. 1984, not 1983. 13 months later was wow. the next time we ever spoke to him. But in the meantime, I knocked on, we knocked on a few doors and of his crew. And one of these guys was a, not the cop, he gave me tidbits of information, tidbits. He never told me that he was involved with setting 50 fires, ever. But he told me that they stole a brand new unmarked cruiser from Natick Ford. And they stole parts from that cruiser to, for their own per mock cruisers. You know, these guys are all driving around in the LTDs the and the Impalas. Yeah. Oh, black, you know. And it helped them get away at night. They could drive into Roxbury, Dorchester, Jamaica Plain, and park in the middle of the night. Two white guys get out in these predominantly minority neighborhoods, you know. Yeah. And who else, who else in the right mind would be there except maybe a couple of cops, you know. Sure. Yep. So, so they upgraded their own personal cruiser and dumped it into the Four Point Channel. Four Point Channel, for those who don't know, is a body of water that divides, like, downtown Boston from – uh, Southie, okay? They dumped it in the channel. Well, he told me that. This source of information told me that. He was, Why is he telling me this? Yeah. You know? Why is he telling me this crap? And eventually, we got the Boston cop in the room and interviewed him with that new information that we recovered that car with the Boston dive teams. And uh, the stolen parts were missing. You know, the grill and the headlights and a few mm -hmm. other parts. And um, he confessed in January of 84. And then he went to federal court the next day and couldn't talk to us again for another five months. <laughs> then he decided to help us, and we wired him 17 times to meet the other guys. And that's how the case came together. Wow, that's you amazing. Know? Did he get um, a sweetheart deal out of that, or did he get some kind of... You know, he was part of in over 100 fires, plus the conspiracy and some other things. Um, he got a 12-year sentence, which really was a great sentence. Yeah. Uh, Greg Bemis was the second one. Greg, that's his picture behind me in Burn, Boston, Burn, this, this way. The camera's not Yeah, it's reversed. Oh, that, oh, yeah, yeah, the cover okay. of the book. Yep, yep. Yeah. That's his picture of a Jamaica plane fire. And... Uh, Greg was the second one in the door, and he signed a 30-year agreement. 30 years to give us testified in, in trial and be fully cooperative, and it got reduced in federal court back then. After 10 years, you were eligible for parole, and because of his cooperation and everything, he did just a little over 10. Right, so that's uh, a long time. The longest, yeah, the longest sentence was 40 years for one guy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Damn. So, that's insane. It's, it's, I, I was okay, reading this. I was reading about it online, and I was like, "This can't be real." I, I feel like a. I feel like I should have known about it. You know, it's like I, I hadn't heard about that. You know, it's the same thing right in Boston. Unless you're 55 years or older, 
uh, you have no inkling of it. Like the Wahlbergs grew up in Dorchester. Yep. And the Wahlbergs grew up during this time period, and they know about it. Um, but yet most people, including Boston firefighters who are new to the job today, don't really know about the case. And um, I've had so many strangers say, I'm glad you brought this part of Boston fire history of Boston history, uh, you know, into a book. And, you know, I, I have to gig my own book in a sense that the people who give me those bad reviews are, are the real readers of the world. I, the firefighters and police read it and they like the story. Sure. But the real readers of the world, the real, the real readers of the world say it's too much repetition. And, you know, I, I tried to narrow it down. I didn't put 264 fires in there, but I put in, you know, 140 of them. And some of them are only a sentence. But on a good night where um, they almost got caught by the state police down in Foxborough, I mean, the trooper pulled the car over because they went through a red light. And they had just set the fire. It hasn't gone yet. It's like 150 yards away. And the trooper saying, you know, license and registration, and he pulls out his badge, too, and they talk for a minute, and then they screw. Right. And, you know, they get away. And there's about three or four occasions like that that they almost got caught. That's insane. Wow. I'm going to have to ask my father. I'm, I'm sure he knows. He's, um, like I said before, he's he's 75. I'm sure he knows all about it. I mean, that's a huge thing. There's, I mean, obviously, it was national news. Um Dang man, um, glad you caught him. I, I I can't I can't I can't imagine being in your position, being a law enforcement officer, being a special agent, investigating a cop. It it's like uh, the guy's betraying the whole the oath. You know, it's like, it it must be like a, a guy like you who is um, you know upright and, and righteous and all those things, um, doing your due diligence having to come down on cops, it must, it must suck so bad. And you must also think like, how did this guy even get this far in law enforcement? You know, uh, here's, here's a little uh, tidbit. Uh, my partner, Billy Murphy, what a small world. His father-in-law was the head of internal affairs at the Boston PD. Oh, wow. When, when we did the search warrant on this guy, he was told, Billy was told, you're no longer welcome here at Boston PD. And Billy used to go there all the time, uh, help make cases on other cases and stuff. He said, you're no longer welcome, you know? Really? And, yeah, they said, you know, he said he got it at the flea market. We believe he got it at the flea market. And other Boston cops eventually helped us um, the night that he, that Bobby Grabluski, the Boston cop, confessed. In the room were two detectives and a deputy superintendent, and they were very helpful. And uh, they could not believe what he said that night during his confession. They could not believe it at all. They didn't want to. They didn't want to believe it either. That's the thing. They, yeah. These guys, there is a brotherhood, and you have each other's back, and you don't want to believe that he's capable of that, and he's gonna, he's gonna stain the BPD badge. And you don't want to see it happen, but you got, I mean, I interviewed um, a friend of mine from backgrounds in LAPD, um, Dave Escoto, uh, gr such a fun interview. He, he did vice and all that fun stuff. And he was eventually a homicide detective, but he was internal affairs for a while. And he said, you have to look at it like, you know, policing your own is, is the best thing you can do for, for your own agency. Like you, you really need to, um, get a hold of going after those people who are standing the badge to get rid of them. Yeah. Cause you don't ultimately want their, you know, their toxicity to stain the whole agency who, if, if, if you don't catch them early, who knows what they're capable of once they get cocky and they get away with a bunch of stuff. Right. And now they're, you know, it's unbelievable. You're leaving the scene of an arson and you're, and you're tinning the guy who pulls you over Knowing he's just going to be like, ah, right, you know, slow down or whatever. It's uh, it's gross. You know, it's a gross yeah. uh, abuse of power, and it's um, you know, my hats off to you, brother. That 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 must have been a really wild ride, and what an unbelievable outcome. Thank goodness yeah, you got yeah. him. The, 
the weird thing about the book is almost the first half of the book is really we were stumbling around. We didn't know, you know, once once you get a uh, serial larson type case going, you have to I, identify that it's a serial case to begin with, and then who's responsible. When you're reading the book, I use Greg Bemis's two to four hundred hour interview of him after his confession and prepping for trials, and then use a hundred and sixty three page single space typed journal that he wrote when he went to prison. I know what Greg talks like. I was with Greg two nights ago uh, on a Zoom with a, a screenwriter and producers. H- had you seen him since this? Uh, all the time. Really? So him. you have a relationship with him? I have what I call a friendly, professional relationship. Interesting. He, he never hated us. He never got angry with us. Uh, he sent Christmas cards to our office and stuff like that. When it was so he prison. understood he did wrong. Yes. Obviously, and he gave so, you that information. He, it yes. seems like he wanted to confess. So he did this journal in prison. And what he wrote was the same stuff that he told me during that two to 400 hours I spent to him with him, uh, debriefing and brief and prepping him for trial. And, um, uh, so what I wrote in the book, especially in the first half to three quarters is the actual thoughts, actions, words between the arsonists, because when Greg says something to me today or that back then, it's the same words that the other guy. I interviewed every one of these guys eventually. That's got to so be I fascinating know what reading that. You know, so it sounds like fiction when you're reading it because you actually hear the words between these guys, and then it gets real later on. You know, and they think, and they think obviously they're on they're being righteous, like they're. They're on a mission, and they're doing – they've convinced themselves they're doing the right thing. Yes. When the newspaper picked it up, uh, you know, they loved it. They just sucked it up. When, you know, as a matter of fact, Greg Bemis himself burned a Massachusetts State Fire Academy building. It was an old <laughs> – it was an old building. He, he burned it himself, and um, he still takes credit. For the fact that we have a much newer, nicer facility. Oh, man. And, yeah. <laughs> and eventually something got passed called the Traeger Bill. The Traeger Bill put money back into the cities and towns to help rehire people. And he, this was on the show Chronicle. Uh, you're in West Virginia. You know the show oh, Chronicle? I love Chron- Are you kidding me? Chronicle was just down in New Salem General Store last year. I love them. Okay. Well, you can find episode this episode on uh google burn boston burn and you'll come up with the chronicle episode um it, they did the full half hour on this story and they it aired in uh, november of 19 and then again uh february of 20 that's pretty hard and, hitting for chronicle too oh it is it's usually really they keep it stuff. light yep so uh they asked Greg, we asked Greg, the producer and I asked Greg if he would participate. And he said, nah, it's too close to home. He works for a company today. His boss knows who he is. And a lot of people know who he is. He has a different last name because he went into witness protection, of, uh, you know, when he was in prison and stuff. Sure. <laughs> and uh, so we asked him to participate and he said no. But he did answer a couple emails and a very last minute of the show is an email that he answered and he does take credit for the Traeger bill being passed. It would not have been passed if it wasn't for our unfortunate ex. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So he, yeah. he stayed with the mission the whole time. Yep. Unreal. So, That's really bizarre. <laughs> you, did, yeah. you read that, but you were like, damn it. <laughs> You know, I did not preview it ahead of time. I didn't know he answered it that way. Oh, <laughs> you know? man, that's, that's nuts. Yeah. You Wait. know, they, they, be, they became domestic terrorists who enjoyed what they were doing, too, and and screwing with the investigators, they enjoyed that, too. So, Yeah, it sounds like they got addicted to it. That's They, they did. 
Oh man, that's that's screwed up. What a crazy and awesome case. Um, Wayne, can you tell us about a, a heartwarming situation you came across as a special agent? Is there any? If not, we can go right to the next question. Hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, some know, guys don't have an answer for this. The Boston police officer bombing happened in October of 91. I was part of the national response team um, ATF has. We respond to any large incidents or loss of life or bombings and stuff like that within 24 hours, any okay. place in the country. And, you know, we went to uh, that fire, uh, that explosion. There was an outdoor explosion and killed a bomb squad police officer from Boston. And uh, researching it more for the book, for my second book, there's a chapter on that in the second book. And, um, you know, I take these type of murders and these horrific crimes to heart, too. And again, sure. when Jeremiah Hurley, who died eventually that night, when the bomb went off, he was with Frank Foley. Frank just died two weeks ago or so. Um, Frank got lost an eye and had burns and several surgeries and stuff like that. When two uniformed officers who were out in the street came racing up into the yard where the explosion occurred, Jeremiah Hurley, who's dying, said, how's Frank? Is he going to be okay? That type of thing. The wherewithal wow. of this guy with the blast and, you know, tell my family I love them and everything, you know? Mm. That that just tears you apart. And I didn't know this until I wrote the book. And there was a rookie female police officer who was one of the two that were the first on scene. She later committed suicide. Oh. And a lot of it had to do with this case. Had to do with this bombing. And... um you know, I had some contact indirectly to the family to see if Frank was willing to be interviewed for my chapter in the book. And Frank could not do it. Again, PTSD, he could not do it. And that was um, 30 years, 30 years after the fact. And so to me, uh, that's somewhat if you want to call it heartwarming it's it tears your heart out is what it does yeah you know? absolutely we have um we've had guests in the past um a bunch of guests who've you know you come on this show and it's people love to hear a cop talk they just they love it they, they it's like lifting the curtain to hear what you guys actually do and I never, a lot of times I take it for granted because I've been, I've done so many interviews now. Um, let's hear the stories. And some, some guys will get into it and they get, they get broken up over it. And I totally get it. I mean, they're asking them to relive this, these stories that are hugely um, traumatic. The, the, I think, I think, mo, I mean, it's the rare cop almost that doesn't have some sort of PTSD, some sort of, some kind of a affli mental affliction from doing this job. And it doesn't matter from small town to big cities. I know cops of all, all varieties that if, if you work long enough, if, if you do a career in law enforcement, you're going to be affected by seeing this stuff. It's not normal. It's not in the course of a life. Most people, especially nowadays when people aren't dying at home, really, you're going to see all the bad things in your community. You're going to be the one guy that's there for everything. When a normal person um, will see like a fraction of that, just not even close, and it will stick with them and they'll tell that story about the tragedy that they saw. And but then we expect police officers, law enforcement officers, special agents to just constantly incur these things. It, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, um, there's, a, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of issues out there. And it's, it's great to hear that from what I hear now, still being an active police officer, they're, it's, it's, they're a lot more aware of it. I mean, even when I started um, 15 years ago, 
it was more like, hey, just you have some feelings. There's a number on the wall. You know, you can call yeah. this number. Yeah. Now there actually is like impact teams and people that will talk with you and they've normalized, you know, the screwed up stuff that we see. Um, man, that's uh, that is heartwarming that someone in infeasibly, as far as he knows, his last moments is worried about somebody else. I mean, right. what a heart on that guy. Right. It's incredible. Beautiful. You know, you know, the first time that uh, I hadn't seen anything bad myself, but I was such good friends with that Walpole mess cop, the one who introduced me to my wife, my first wife. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, you know, he, he was like one of the first officers at a car accident in this town. And again, Walpole's a pretty small town. Yeah. And you you can happen on it today, tomorrow. Um, and, you know, I've been the first person at a car accident just because it happened like 15 seconds in front of me and on a, on a side country road. But uh, it wasn't horrific. Like, you know, he described that two 19-year-old girls are shredded in the car. Yeah. You know, uh, how do you get over that stuff? You know? Yeah. It's not easy. Not easy at all. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, even on the country, like you said, even on a country road, you can have somebody begging and pleading for you to get them out of the car that they're entrapped in that is on fire and they're oh. burning, burning alive. It's like, you know, it's, it's some crazy stuff. There's definitely crazy stuff out there. You know, on the private side, uh, there was a propane explosion at brand new condos about uh, 15 minutes from here. And I helped investigate it for part of the insurance afterwards. And, but my ex-brother-in-law is a fire chief in uh, the neighboring town. And it was his guys were assisting in that scene. And there was uh, the electricians were finishing up. The house was going to be moved into the next week uh, when the explosion occurred. And um, it, it totally collapsed and fire started in one corner. And the one electrician who played in a band at my coworker's wedding. My brother-in-law is holding his head up in the water because they're putting water to try to put the fire out in the basement, but he's covered in debris. I mean, covered by hundreds and hundreds of pounds. He's holding his head up, talking to the young guy, like 35 years old, talking to him as he ends up, dying basically in his arms, Man. you know, because you couldn't get him out. You have people trying to get him out, but they're trying to put the fire out that's going to burn him to death, that the water's going to drown him. This, you know, <laughs> and so, you know. It's crazy. Let me ask you a question about um, Walpole PD, because I just had a class at Police Academy, um, a leadership class, and there was a retired lieutenant from Walpole PD taught it. And he's been retired for some quite time, quite some time. I can't remember his name, but he had glasses and he was funny. He was like a, he was a great instructor. Did you know any of those command staff? Um, I knew all the way up to, uh, you know, a, a detective who moved up into uh, between a, a deputy a chief at one point. And he was a lieutenant to Scott um, and Rick. There was another guy, Rick. Right now, I can't pick the last name. Scott almost shot me one night. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Some guys did a uh, a robbery of uh, what was the whole Joe's type of restaurant? Not the whole Joe's, but the other family restaurant that they had. Um, but in the corner of Route One and Twenty Seven in Walpole, a busy intersection, and they did a robbery there. And there's woods behind there, and I was working with those guys regularly. So when they responded, I was with them. And we're out in the woods at night looking for these guys. And I climb on these um, curbings. The uh, state had piled these curbings up, you know, okay. the uh, gra granite. Yep. Uh, up Big about slabs. five or six. Yes, five or six feet up. And I climbed on top and laid down on top of it to see if I could see or hear a bad guy. And Scott saw movement up there and he said freeze <laughs> <laughs> and you know he almost shot me that night um but those those That's are the two guys, guys i remember yeah oh, um man i wish i you know bringing it up i should have the guy's name but i don't remember it. yeah um wayne 
one of the most popular questions we have is advice for people getting into law enforcement. There's someone out there that wants to be a special agent, thinking about it, isn't sure. Um, what kind of advice, somebody with your kind of experience, what, what could you give to them? Um, yes. If you're going on the federal side, and if you think you might end up moving up someday, you, you're going to have to move. So be willing to move. Uh, I stayed in Boston because I never wanted to go into that supervision. And um, as I said before to people, take care of your body, stay in shape, take care of your mind, whatever that takes, whether it's meditation or counseling or what. Um, be willing to work long, hard hours, and don't give up. Be persistent, patient, and just keep digging. Be that, in the you know, Boston area, be that Trot Nixon. Be that uh, <laughs> yeah. Pedroia, Pedroia type. The guys, those, those uh, second basemen, those guys who dive for everything, are dirty uniforms, you know, sure. people outside of Massachusetts, you know your guys. The ones who are always dirty, the ones who always give everything. Have some you got to be, you have to be that, and learn how to talk, and learn how to write, and learn how to listen, because you're going to talk to a lot of people, trying to get information, and you have to listen to get the best information. Absolutely, great advice, and it's funny that listening part is a helped me in my podcast because when I was thinking of starting this podcast, I read a lot of reviews about other podcasts. Like what are people saying about these podcasts? The biggest complaint of a podcast host is he won't shut up and let the guests tell the story. We know Steve and we, you know, we know the thing about what we know the show in the format. And when the guest is always interjecting constantly, that was like the biggest complaint. So I said, when I started the show, I'm just going to, and like you said, in police work, when you're doing an interview, just listen. And even when you do an interrogation, silence is okay. You know, you can yes. let them think about it because they're going to start. People are uncomfortable. They'll they'll keep the ball rolling. Um, so that's that's great advice. Uh, absolutely. Let, where can people uh, contact you? Where can they um, get a hold of your books and stuff? We got a <laughs> picture of your website right here. Yep. Go to uh, burnbostonburn.com, and both books are on there. But burnbostonburn.com, just Google it. Uh, you'll find some of my episodes where I did live. I've done over uh, 50 live speaking events now around the country. Um, How many podcasts have you done, Wayne? Uh, about 15 of them. How dare you? Yeah, <laughs> from, from Florida to uh, Arizona to England. Good for you. Uh, yeah, all over the place. Um, you'll find my email right on the website. If you scroll all the way down, it's author, author Wayne Miller, not author, author Wayne Miller, <laughs> all one word, uh, at Gmail. Um, even my phone number, my cell phone's on there. Um, I'm uh, the only social media I ever had in my life is related to the book. Uh, Facebook, it says, um, yep, there. Yeah. Facebook says uh, Burn Boston Burn, and my LinkedIn. I have over nine thousand police and fire and professors connections around the country. Holy cow! And it's Burn, Burn Boston Burn um, is that my LinkedIn. If you hit Wayne Miller, you can find me too. And um, that's about it. Awesome, Wayne. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. It was an honor to have you. Great mm -hmm. stories, incredible. I mean, we didn't even get even close yeah. to the nuance yeah. they could find in the book, so I'm sure people will be checking that out. Um, it was an honor, brother. Thank you so much. Can you hang up for one second when I do the outro? Sure. I love it. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, if people get the book through my website rather than Amazon, I have color pictures in my book. Amazon does not, and nobody else does. Uh, Barnes & Noble so sell my books, and they don't have it. And also, I sign the book and put it in the mail myself. You're kidding. And That's awesome. I do it. The books are right. I got 300 <laughs> books upstairs right now. Phenomenal. <laughs> you know? That's so, great. So, 
All right, brother. Thank you. I'll be right with you. Okay? Very good. Okay. You got it. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Wayne M. Miller. Man, that was fun. I love uh, I love uh, getting the nuance and the specialties of law enforcement. Very cool. Thank you, Wayne, for coming on. Guys, thank you so much. As I said in the beginning, thank you for all the five-star reviews on the show. If you love the show and you want to show your support, five-star review on Apple, uh, Apple Podcasts. No big deal. It's easy. Get it done. I appreciate it. We're at the part of the show now where I'm going to thank the patron, the Patreon, the patrons that are sergeants um, of the show and also sergeants of my heart, if we're being honest. I'm talking about Wayne M. Miller, Nick Noose, the great Tom Connell, Dennis. Got no last name, brother, so just Dennis. Andrew Proctor, George Tessier, also known as Zip, Motor Cop Chronicles. Il- uh, Ilian, I know you told me how to do it. I'm sorry. Uh, Elian Rogers, Greg Gadboy, Ben Peters, Rick McCormick, Scott Minkler, Parker Brower, the great Tammy Wall, Sean Clifford, Braden Walker, Sasha McNabb, Corey Payne, the great Mike Wynn, Nathan Gowan, Jason Lau, Dylan Pyrosic, the great Sarah 